So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Jim, James McCants. He's a director, Township of Haverford Paramedic Department. And he's going to um, talk about the paramedic EMS perspective. Let's give him a, uh, a round of applause. Thanks for the invite to be here. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Jim McCanns, and I've been in EMS, don't tell me, 39 years. So uh, I've seen a little bit. I'm like that commercial. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've we seen a lot of stuff, whatever, that, that farmer's commercial. I, I, I simply, I understand. But uh, I'm going to go just do a little bit of the history of... Uh, uh, naloxone and a little bit of uh, what's going on in EMS and um, and the uh, our response here in Delaware County I do sit on the uh, heroin task force with I see some of my colleagues here in the room but um, I'm going to take you for a little run through this so naloxone is the generic name patented in 1961 it took 10 years to approve it for opioid overdoses <coughs> Evidently, its main, its original purpose, although targeted for opioid, opioid overdoses, was to um, be able to reduce the effect of opioids in uh, anesthesia. So if they wanted to bring somebody back up out of anesthesia a little bit more quickly after surgery, they could give this agent. But there was always an underlying thought that it could be used for any kind of opioid overdose. Uh, so, not, uh, 71 became available for that purpose and was uh, distributed to emergency rooms. In 1976, the first paramedic units in Delaware County, among them Crozer Chester Medical Center's unit, which was staffed at the time by nurses, th there were no paramedics yet at that point. Uh, there's a difference between a paramedic and an EMT. An EMT functions at a basic life support level. All paramedics are EMTs, not all EMTs are paramedics. Paramedics do advanced life support, which includes your medication, GKGs, that sort of thing, advanced airways, and some other procedures. So it's, it's just a whole different level. But they were forming paramedic classes and starting paramedics at the time, but Crozier Chester staffed with nurses. Some who had um, came out of um, Vietnam, some medics who became nurses, and were now working uh, in that environment. They carried Narcan. It's not the Narcan that we know today. It was the brand name of Naloxone at the time. It came in a little vial. A needle has to be introduced, drawn up, and then given to the subject. It was always given IV. In 1982, I'm in my paramedic class, and there's a comment made that stuck with me. It kind of went back in the old recesses of my mind and then came back up again later when this crisis started. And in the class I was in when we got to that point of pharmacology where we talked about Narcan, we, there was a comment by the instructor and it was, you'll always know a junkie. That was the word that was used. They all look like Keith Richards. We all laughed because they did. That emaciated look, and if we look back, heroin was nowhere near as pure as it is today. There was a lot of stuff put in it. People had to cook it at a very high temperature to get it to liquefy, draw it up, and inject it in hot into their veins. We had this terrible scarring. If you remember, people would have tracks, they called it. Just, it was like uh, pieces of, of, of tire under their skin. It was very difficult to actually access an IV site. Keep in mind, it's the only way we knew to give Narcan at the time. So we're trying to find an open vein in somebody who's been at it for years. Also at the time, I don't know that we realized it, but HIV was starting. Hep C was already around. So this emaciated look was also those diseases showing up. Keith Richards is still alive. <laughs> but, but that's not true anymore. We don't, people don't look like that anymore. They look like us and our kids, and in some cases our parents. <clears throat> so, in the early 80s, the opioid crisis is growing, and it gets knocked down because of the HIV outbreak. And for two reasons th that were pretty clear on. One, uh, an awful lot of people contracted the disease through needle sharing and other behaviors associated with it, and died of HIV. But it was also difficult to recruit anybody into using needles at the time. If you think about the stigma that came with it in the 80s, if somebody should take out a needle, it's like somebody coming in this room and taking out a hand grenade. So everybody's going, you couldn't get anybody to go near it. 
it was that kind of thing. It was people, yeah, I'm not going to try that, never mind, because you'll get really sick from that. So, in, in the 1990s, we started to notice this crisis was starting to build again. In 2012, the Heron Task Force is formed in Delaware County. And we, this, Delaware County is really out ahead of this. I joined later on, but it really, it started kind of down in the bowels of, uh, of the, the courthouse in that tiny little room that, you know, uh, but, but it's really blossomed into a, an awful lot of people doing a heck of a lot of good work. So it's formed then. In July 4th, I had uh, a moment that, that brought me on board more than most medics at the time, and that is that I lost my stepbrother to this. And I saw, looking back, I could see where mistakes were made and the behaviors and whatever, and, and I could understand it. But Jimmy died of this, and I, I said, you know what? Ironically, he died on July 4th, Independence Day. I think it was the first time in his life he was really independent, in his adult life, he was truly independent. Like he truly was not depending on uh, a drug or, or the behaviors associated with the drugs. So, um, November 26th, 2014, is an important day in Delaware County and in Pennsylvania. It's the first time that naloxone is given by police. At this time, the uh, patent for Narcan is long gone. I've, in my, most of my career as a medic, I've known it as naloxone. It's under its generic name. It's like acetaminophen versus Tylenol. Everybody buys the cheaper one in EMS, so you get, uh, you get naloxone. And when uh, we first come up with the, the state approves the, uh, the administration by police to give it, it also includes firefighters. It didn't include EMTs, which, can I tell you what a problem that became in just within the emergency services world? And it's only because EMTs were answering to the Department of Health and were under specific rules. And those rules took a little longer to change than it did for just having lay people give the medication, which is kind of how it was looked at at the time. Lay people with training under the auspices of their job. So that's kind of how that came together in uh, 2014. And in uh, 2017, Health and Human Services declares this a public health emergency. <laughs> I mean, three years after we're already given stuff in the field but declares it a public health emergency after 42,000 people pass away from this disease the year before. How is naloxone given? IV is the optimum route, if we can give it intravenously. Now I'm still talking about naloxone. This is the version the paramedics give. It's two milligrams in uh, five cc's of flu. I'm sorry, in two cc's of flu. So the next best way, theoretically, is IO. That's intraosseous. That's, we drill a little needle into the bone, into the leg bone or into a shoulder, and inject it there. It's very quick, direct in the bone marrow, and that communicates right into the vascular system. I know, it gives me the willies too. I, I get it. But it works very well, and if you think about it, this person's essentially anesthetized when they get it, and then when they wake up, it can be removed. But there are si there, there's problems with this. IV, we have to have an IV site. You have to be able to find an, uh, a, a suitable vein. If the person injects their heroin, that can be difficult. Um, not as bad as it used to be, but it's still out there. You still have to find a site. Uh, IO, it's very quick, but now once we remove that needle, we do essentially have theoretically an open fracture of the leg because there's an open hole through the bone and that's known for, I mean, that can actually cause infection or be a site for pretty serious infection. So we need follow up at a hospital. These people are allowed to refuse once they're woken up. So we're putting them in a difficult situation, putting ourselves in a difficult situation. But in the moment, you do what's best to reverse that person. Intranasaler is the correct way to do it for lay people. We stick in, uh, or police officers or rescuers, into the nose and blown up into the uh, sinuses. 
any point where there's mucosal membrane and there's contact, they can absorb and uh, we'll get a rapid onset of the drug's use. There's a downside to this too. If somebody has snorted their product, if they've snorted their heroin, or if they're a pill crusher and they snort the pills, the debris can line the inside of the nose and stick to that mucosa, which blocks the absorption of, or delays the absorption of the uh, naloxone when, once it's given up into that area. Intramuscular, it does work well. It takes a little longer than the other methods, but it also forces us to have a sharps, which now we've injected and now we have a needle that's been put into somebody who does have behaviors that would lend themselves to having uh, uh, additional infections. Oral has to be mentioned. It is a way to do it, but that's more into the chronic world. It's not in the immediate phase. Oral the, the, takes the longest amount of time to absorb. I do have to mention too, endotracheal. Paramedics have sometimes started working on somebody, put an advanced airway in, they put the same tube you'd get if you're under general surgery, and then somewhere along the line, maybe somebody finds evidence, a story shows up, that uh, um, it's possibly opioid related. At that point, they would, they can spray it down the ET tube. Now if they wake up, they have a tube in their throat and they just woke up, there's gonna be a battle in your hands. It's gonna be a problem. That behavior again has changed. Medics don't go to that until they're sure that it's not an opioid over. They'll just go ahead and give the Narcan and say, let's give the Narcan and figure out later if this is an actual opioid overdose. And that shows up in our numbers as we go along here. So this is what it looks like. And uh, I'm not giving a hard time to any of my police brothers or sisters, but yeah, I was part of the training for this. And it was assembling this device, which is glass and, and brittle plastic. You can't police proof anything. It was, uh, am I, you know, am I right? Come on, help me, help me here. <laughs> but it was literally, I think for every two doses that was successfully given, one was kind of destroyed just by people putting it together. If you don't do it every day, it just if you go a little bit further, the plastic breaks and the glass cracks, it, it is truly meant to be in an operating room kind of situation. It's not meant as a field device. But I'll tell you, it was very successfully employed in Delaware County. So it did work out very well. Once people kind of got it a few times, it was gold. So November 29th was the first day police could legally administer naloxone. I want you to note that, because that's not the first day that we gave it. We gave it a couple days before. Everybody was trained, it was available, the police officer in Ridley Park went on location and, <laughs> and said, you know what, I know what this is, I can save this person, I'm giving it. Calls DA Whalen the next day and says, I have to turn, I, I gotta disclose, I, I gave this. He's like, congratulations, you saved a life. Who cares? That's what we're here for. We're, nobody's looking at a calendar. Let's just, let's, let's start saving lives. And within uh, a month, EMTs followed, thank God. That was just such, such a, a dust up. Look at the directions uh, on the left versus the new directions on the right. This is the switch um, to Narcan and police. Paramedics still carry naloxone. We have to have a choice. We need those other methods. We can give it IV. We may have to alter how much we're given. Rather than just a four milligram pop up the nose, we may have situations that aren't necessarily an opioid overdose where we have to control how much we're getting. For instance, if we have the elderly person whose loved one put a, uh, uh, and the person has cancer and, and they're really ill with it and that, that person leaves the room and another loved one comes in, here's the person moaning and puts another patch on. Oh, you know, they didn't get their patch yet. Well, that is an opioid overdose. But if we give the full four milligram pop, we're gonna erase all of the ability, all the effects of their uh, pain relief. But if we give just enough to kind of bring them back up so where their respiratory function is, is, is uh, they can handle the airway and their, air, uh, and their airway function is, um, or respiratory function is sufficient, then that is what we're shooting for. So there's times that we will alter that a little bit 
and, and there's some other situations, we don't have to go into all of them, but you see that sometimes we really have to titrate it as to what we need to do. But this was the program that we we're teaching police officers, firefighters, and other rescuers how to put together our system and then add the atomizer on the end and squirt up the nose. And they make it look pretty good with six steps. They reduced it to four. But hold on. I digress. Let's go back here. They don't put their number one as taking the thing out of the package. <laughs> I mean, they look like to me they were really trying to add steps to this one. And this is where you identify what a nose is. <laughs> Actually, if you ask me, all they needed was two and three. Here it is, stick it in the nose and push. And that's what you have to do. <laughs> and immediately we went from that 20 some percent problem rate to zero complications. It's also more concentrated than what we had. It's four milligrams and about 0.25 cc's. So this was actually, this was a real boom for us. Stick it in, pop up it goes, and we were getting some pretty decent reversals. We're getting a lot of decent reversals. We'll talk about the numbers right now. So our years are a little off. They begin on the 26th of, of uh, November every year. So year one, you'd see about 163 reversals. There is a troubling st statistic here, and it's on the end. It's where you see the male-female ratio. That closes every year. And that's, that's always been disturbing to us. So wow, that was, in the beginning, it's almost three to one, and it's down about two to one. And as of recently, I think it's even just, a, it's in the 1.9 range. So it's kind of equalizing. So. Uh, that is disturbing that we're having more and more females involved. Uh, it's disturbing with anybody, but when you start to see that group, you wonder how they're getting recruited so, so rapidly. But if we follow through our, uh, our years, look at the tremendous amount of resuscitations we're getting here. Now, these are people who are not breathing. The police are coming in, checking them. Hey, hey, wake up, are you there? If you think police get there more quicker than the medics do, because there's so many more of them, and they're, they're, they, they work smaller sections. So they're on location very quickly. They have small districts, and they'll get there, and they, they're, they're truly among the people. Medics tend to be stationed and respond from the station, so it does take a little longer. We know that uh, just looking at the uh, CPR model and defibrillation, getting defibrillators into the hands of police, having police start CPR, has pushed the uh, survival rate through the roof. So just that having somebody competent and trained on location is really making a difference. Well, if we go to, uh, we look at the uh, year of 2016 to 2017, we peak at 552 reversals that year. Police only reversals. Then it starts to come down a bit. We see that we're starting to come down. This isn't like something to really celebrate here, year five. I actually believe, uh, I got a bad number here. I actually think that's, um, the 1st of February were these numbers. But uh, I'll check into that and correct it. But that's only, a, a, it only really represents the first two or three months of this, of that year. So, you know, it doesn't, we shouldn't be so You can see that the number's starting to come down. But what didn't come down was the business at the morgue. That stayed fairly close. It came down a little bit, but not as much as you would hope. This also coincides with Narcan becoming available for families to, to access. Yes, sir. So these are all successful reversals? These are successful reversals here, yes, sir. So uh, it's been a tremendous program. And, and to this day, I believe Delaware County still leads all the other counties in the state for this. We're, uh, yes, sir. Excuse me, is there any, any variable in here that's saying that treatment and prevention is being having some success uh, it's not in these numbers we we don't look at it in these numbers this is truly a form that comes back within hours of the uh, police administration it's turned in uh, to CID and CID reissues the medication and that's pretty much where it stops we don't collect the person's name we don't collect any of that information there's sometimes I've looked at some of the papers that have come in I'm like okay this is the same person and I can see that in a couple of cases. And a few cases I knew about, there was, I think one in Tinicum where the same person was, they woke the same person up three times and 
36 hours, I think it was. Have it for township, we had somebody twice in nine hours. So there's, there are some really difficult cases we know about, but we did not track that at that point. I mean, this thing, when we first set this up, this was so early in the program too. It was like, my God, we didn't even know quite what to put on those forms. Dr. Dickinson at the time, uh, the guy who kind of picked up the mantle for this is came out with that, that quick to check off form. Just for time concerns, can we can we utilize the cards for questions, please? Okay. I apologize. So this is the program uh, for all of 2018. It's the first time Delaware County was able to, uh, um, it, it, EMS uh, was uh, party to getting a bridging program so that all the versions of the charting and medical charting programs that EMS use could all be blended together and all the information could be extracted and then it was forwarded to the state for all kinds of EMS stuff, from cardiac arrest to childbirth to pediatric cases, everything would go up the big data upload. But the county was able to, to parse out what I needed for this and we do a comparison. So this is the first time, 2018, that we're able to get all police, all EMS. 1,173 total patients in Delaware County reversed through police and EMS efforts in one year. And that, it's, it's a staggering number. Nothing else in medicine, nothing else in medicine has been this successful. That doesn't mean it's the answer to anything outside of waking up that person under these circumstances. And that's what we're trying to do. So right off the bat, you can see who, who the, the appointments are 300. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we had 100, or 1,173 total patients, 1,072 reversals. And you kind of see how we broke it all the way down. What, one of the things that pops out of me, the average age remains a little higher than one would think. And uh, EMS has a higher age because EMS also has, a, it goes by protocols. We have to give naloxone to certain patients who are unconscious. We can suspect it's a stroke, we can suspect it's something else, but we give it anyhow because it's part of our, the protocol for an unconscious subject. That also explains why some numbers can be lower we have an unconscious child, and it turns out later they find a different reason for why that child was unconscious. But it can skew our numbers a little bit. But if we do break it out, we take a look at the uh, patients who have responded to, nar nar to naloxone or to Narcan um, uh, in its totality, we do see that the uh, age span goes from four years old to 91 years old. So responding, that is diagnostic of an opioid event. If they wake up to that medication being given, we're fairly sure that that's what the problem was. One of the takeaways was when this is averaged about 3.53 uh, milligrams per patient. Narcan is four milligrams. So that's actually, it shows that's about the right dose for most adults about four milligrams, and the overwhelming majority is given intranasally. And if it's given in the, uh, in the nose, four milligrams is about right. It appears to be the right concentration to cover that area. So their research lines up pretty much with what we've been seeing. <clears throat> now what? Okay, we're given Narcan or Naloxone, we're waking people up. What's the next step? Well, I'll tell you that this isn't something new. I didn't come up with this. I've gleaned this from other people. There's a push to amend Act um, 2014, Act 139 from 2014. Um, so there'll be a mandatory interaction with somebody before they can be released by police or by EMS. They have to talk to a, uh, a certified uh, um, recovery, specialist. recovery specialist. I said counselor. I put CRC counselor. But we've gone through a couple names over the years. Sure. But we want them to talk and interact with somebody. Extremely frustrating for the police to wake somebody up, realize this person was dead. Maybe they ventilated them a little bit and they get the person back up and the person walks away and they know they're like, oh, this is just going to happen again. Very frustrating among them. And it was truly born of, but my God, I know you need to talk to somebody. We pulled somebody off the edge of a building or off the side of a bridge 
we're not just going to let them walk away. We're going to have them talk to somebody. There's a problem. And it is done out of compassion. And it should be, uh, that's good law to say, hey, you know what? Let's have them talk to somebody. Let's get the, let's see if we can help. I think uh, Upper Darby police should get a big nod, especially one platoon that said, you know, we're given an awful lot of uh, Narcan in the field, but some of these people are really blue. They need oxygen. One uh, um, officer who's also a uh, nurse and a medic decided to teach everybody on his platoon how to ventilate somebody with a bag valve mask. So it looks like there's a whole crew of uniformed anesthesiologists in there and they do a great job, ventilate up the person. We found that the whole idea of putting the face mask down on somebody and getting your face down to them, it put the police officer in a very compromised position unless there was another police officer there. They could be down here, hands on the patient and still have the head up. It was, it was the right method, it was the right way to do it, it was recognized. I think that's a great thing. We started teaching our officers in Haverford, in Haverford Township when they come in for their CPR training how to ventilate. And then we go on a regular cardiac arrest, we make sure they do it there so they can keep that skill set up. Um, I think it's important that we keep telling the public or drive home to the public that Narcan can be one hell of an enabling tool. Come in and there's other Narcan packages that are open. About. Well, he did it the other day and I told him, you were dead and I woke you up and I thought that would teach him a lesson. You can see the thought process. But I'm like, Mom, you, had you called us then, things might be different now. Now, I don't say that to Mom, but it's what I'm thinking. I really want to say it to her, but, you know, I, I understand it's not going to help. Danielle Corner, who's out of uh, the 911 center in Delaware County, is looking into something called compassion fatigue. I'm like, come on, who cares? Well, isn't that compassion fatigue? <laughs> who cares? Well, yeah, what they're showing is, I mean, this is taking a toll on all our providers. EMS, uh, take a few minutes and see what the state's looking for across this state. And a lot of it has to do with this. When I started in this business, you did CPR on your grandparents, people your grandparents' age, maybe your parents' age, and occasionally just those horrible cases where somebody was in a car accident or something and they were so young and it was terrible. All my young medics, the majority of people they work on CPR-wise or whatever else, are about their age. And that's not how it's supposed to be. And that takes a huge toll. They note it's one of the things in warfare. In battle, we look at the military, one of the stresses on the medics there is the fact that they're caring for people their age. This guy looks like, this guy could be a friend, but he looks like my friend, he's my brother's age, he's my age. He looks like me. So, it, and it does affect people, and it's, I think it's a blocking mechanism. I also think it's, it's truly unnatural to wake somebody up from an opioid event, or to do CPR on them, or whatever else happens, and then in a few hours go coach a kid's softball game. And you're kind of switching gears in a way you shouldn't be switching gears. Lastly, I think the, one of the things we need to recognize is that for years, we've had trauma centers. And a trauma center means we may bypass the closest hospital to get to a hospital that's ready for the person. A trauma center has the trauma surgeon standing by, has neurosurgery in house, has a CAT scanner up and going. They have a blood supply that they can do a big transfusion on somebody. They're set for this emergency. Cardiac centers, if you're having a heart attack, will bypass a hospital that does not have an interventional cardiologist to get to one that does. Oh, it might take 10 more minutes 15 more minutes to get to the other hospital, but it's going to shave an hour off of your treatment time. That's a great payoff. You know, I can give the aspirin, I can give the O2, I can do whatever on the guy who's having a heart attack. I diagnosed the 12 lead. There's nothing at the smaller hospital that doesn't have those interventions. I can skip around. Strokes, the same thing. Pediatrics, the same thing. I'm going to write down the line, even crisis centers. Yet, when it comes to somebody we wake up with naloxone, go to the closest hospital and drop them off. Uh, should we not be thinking of the model where we take them to a place that has those resources, not unlike the trauma center, 
that says we can treat you for the acute issue, we can treat you for the withdrawal, and we can give you treatment for the long run. And I think we truly need to recognize that. I mean, it's, and the thing is, it's so obvious among medics. I'm like, how can we not tell them people? And I feel like I'm talking to zombies, because <coughs> I think I am talking to zombies. It's really a problem. But hey, I'm putting these things out there. When I say now what, they're just some of the things I've witnessed, some things people have told me, and I'm putting it out there for any answers anybody has. It's really an issue, but I appreciate you listening to this. I am, uh, my portion is complete, sir. Thank you. Thank you.